You're listening to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essentia Health. It only takes one step, twist, or crunch to know something doesn't feel right. Essentia Health's orthopedic and sports medicine team gets you back to doing what you love with commitment, resilience, intention. We're here to keep you moving forward. Visit EssentiaHealth.org to learn more about orthopedics and sports medicine like nowhere else. Hello and welcome to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essentia Health. I'm Matt Wellens, the Bulldogs hockey beat writer at the Duluth News Tribune. And I'm Jack Schneider, the television voice of UMD Hockey and My Nine Sports. Welcome to part two of our two-part, two-episode season six finale of the Bulldog Insider Podcast. If you missed part one, stop listening, go back into your podcast feed, and check out that episode. Then come back to this one. Unless you're weird and like to listen to part two before part one or something like that. Um, I advise you go back, listen to the first one. Lots of good information in there about the men's and, and women's team, um, their last season. And we kind of started talking about the next season going forward as well. We're going to really dive into next season, uh, on part two here, joining us once again, to help wrap up the 2023, 24 men's and women's hockey seasons, as well as look forward to 24, 25. It's the voice of Bulldogs hockey on KDAL, Bruce Siski. Welcome back, Bruce. Thanks again, guys, for having me. I'm very happy to report that it's not baseball season. And it's still snowing. Um, yeah, this episode is dedicated to all of you, our listeners. Um, we love you. We thank you so much for, for making this podcast what it is. Um, we're going to answer as many of your questions as you can. Uh, some of you submitted three, four, five, six questions. I couldn't get to all of those. But uh, for some of you, we we got we got two of your questions in. A lot of you asked similar questions. Um Let's just get right into it. We're going to start with Mr. Blake Biondi, the Minnesota Mr. Hockey out of Hermantown. He came to the Bulldogs as an 18-year-old, saw limited time as a freshman, had a breakout sophomore year before losing a big chunk of that junior year to shoulder surgeries. Um, we had him on to start season six. He had some big aspirations for this season, but just finished with eight goals and 11 assists. Um, we got a number of questions from listeners about Blake Biondi. Um, and this was before the news uh, came out on Tuesday. He made his announcement that uh, he will be transferring to Notre Dame for his fifth and final season of NCAA eligibility. Um, let's get into some of the questions you guys had. Most of them are actually still relevant, and, and we can get you guys some answers from, from what we know. Um, Scott Youngdahl asked, why did Blake Biondi go to a portal? His decision or, or UMD's? Um, you know, my talk, I, I haven't had a chance to talk with, Blake Biondi, uh, I reached out to him, didn't hear back. Um, Jess Myers from the Rink Live, um, my colleague, uh, he has been able to uh, get in touch with, with Blake and, and talk to him a little bit. Um, I've talked to Scott Sandlin, and, and from both our sides, it was it was mutual. Um, Blake decided it was time to move on from UMD. UMD decided it was time to move on from Blake after four years. Guys, what are your thoughts on, on Blake uh, moving on? I know... He was a pretty hyped recruit when he came here, and you're going to have that when you're Minnesota Mr. Hockey and, and you come from Hermantown. Zach, I'll let you start. Yeah, yeah I think this is just a case of, of a talented player who who needed a change of scenery, and it became really clear. Uh, I don't think this was unexpected as the year went on that Blake was going to continue his career elsewhere, whether it was in the portal for another college program or try to make his start of his pro career. Um, you know, I, I said to somebody earlier this week after he announced that he was going in the portal, but before he had announced that he was going to Notre Dame, uh, which that, you know, especially for these Hermantown or these local kids that grow up dreaming of playing at UMD, you finally get there. His first two seasons were pretty good. His sophomore season was excellent. And then you go through some struggles and you go through some injuries and this is a small community. And I think that those local kids know better than anybody that when you sign up to play at UMD, you take the good with the bad. If you're going to celebrate the good and you're going to be kind of the, the celebrity, so to speak, in the community, that comes with some responsibilities and some expectations, but it's still, you know, it doesn't ever sit right with me when young 
kids or young men, whatever you want to call them, you know, still in their college years, deal with what Blake had to deal with. You know, yes, he underperformed this season, but I think Blake got, uh, you know, pretty uh, unfairly targeted um, by by some of the, the fan base because it wasn't just Blake. Blake was not the reason this team didn't succeed in 23-24. Should he go elsewhere and and place and and try someplace new? Absolutely. Like Blake was not at the top of his game this year. Um but I you know I it, it's just a tough thing and I I think you know I certainly wish him success at, at Notre Dame and beyond. I hope everybody else does as well. Um but yeah, it just didn't seem to to work out um the way that they wanted it to after his surgeries um and i'm not sure if that's related uh to to what went on this year and some of his struggles but uh yeah i think it was just time i'll always wonder what blake Biondi's career at umd would have been like had he went to juniors for at least a year if not two years um i i remember thinking the same thing with riley tufty uh when he was minnesota mr hockey I think it's great that Jason Shagaby, who's coming to the Bulldogs next year, got that year away from Minnesota. Um, Cause we, you know, in this state, Mr. Hockey is put on a high pedestal and um, you know, I, I think it's tough for anyone to go right from being, you know, go right from high school to, to college. Um, you know, Max Plant's going to sort of make that jump next year, going for the national team development program to college. It's tough being an 18 year old in college. And I kind of wonder what Blake's career might've been had he not um, come in as an, as an 18 year old freshman. And, and of course the, you know, two shoulder surgeries <laughs> is something else you wonder as, as well, if he's healthy that junior year uh, instead, Bruce, what, what are your thoughts on, on Blake and, and his career at UMD? I think the amount of pressure that any 218 player is under when they come here to play college hockey is immense. And I think what you said hits the nail on the head. Uh, the arc of, of Blake Biondi's career is probably different if one of two things happens. One would be if he had to go to play juniors. And and that would obviously it's up to him. And, and it, it's not just a, a snap your fingers and make a decision call that that's, you know, that's career defining stuff for some of these guys. They, these these are not easy decisions. These are adult decisions, and and sometimes they don't make the right ones. Sometimes it, we don't think they made the right ones. They think that they did. He graduated, and he's going to graduate in four years with a double degree. He did a lot of things right, I would say. Um, but the other thing that happened was the COVID year, and and how much of a setback to his development was the off season going into the COVID year, where everything was so limited. And then the COVID year itself, where everything was so limited, and so I wonder that if, if that's a full se- if that's a normal off season and a full season, how different is the arc of Blake Biondi's career at UMD? I wish him well. Hope he has a great experience. Notre Dame's an awesome, awesome place. Jeff Jackson's a great coach. I hope it goes wonderfully for him. But you know, it, it was probably time to move on. A lot of people when Blake announced that he was going into the portal who were wondering if this is a culture thing at UMD. A lot of comments I saw, oh, Hermantown kid is is transferring out of UMD. And the first thing that jumped into my head when I saw comments like that is Scott Sandlin's son decided to go to Mankato. Sometimes these kids just need to get away from what they've always known. Ryan Sandlin did it and had a great career at Mankato and now is is trying his luck at professional hockey. This was just time for Blake to to get out of his own backyard and and see what can happen at Notre Dame. And next season will tell us a lot about Blake Biondi and and his potential beyond college hockey. Yeah, when we go back to Blake coming in in 2021, the, the COVID year, UMD was kind of in a pinch that year. As I go back and, and look at that roster, um, you had Dylan Sandberg leave after his junior year. Scott Perenovich left after his junior year, granted their defenseman, but uh, Cole Kepke left after his sophomore year. I don't know if, or did he come back? He came, but Cole Kepke came back one more year. Yeah, he was For back. a junior, I believe. Um, yep. Justin Richards signed, didn't he? Justin Richards yeah, signed. Justin that, Richards that, was gone, yep. That was a big one in 1920. And I, and, Blake was brought in originally to be a center and they realized that wasn't a good fit. Um, I believe Jackson Cates came back for another year. They, 
they got into this spot where players were leaving early and UMD is not a program that when it builds its recruiting banks on a ton of players leaving early, like they want guys to be there for four years. They don't have the luxury as some of the big 10 schools do to say, well, this guy's probably be gone after two, two years, um, three years. Some of those schools only budget some of those players to be around for, for two, three years. They don't expect to be there for four. So there's a lot of what ifs in, in Blake Biondi's career at, at, at UMD. Some of the other questions we got relating to Blake was um, uh, from Angel Carl. She, you know, this was in relation when Ben Steve signed. Um, does this mean they'll now have room slash money for Blake to come back for a fifth season? Um, as, as we mentioned in the first uh, part of this uh, two part season finale, um, UMD is not bringing back any of its fifth years. It's not just Blake Biondi who's leaving Zach Stayskull, um, another kid who faced a lot of pressure as a 218 kid. Um, having to come into UMD after another goaltender from Cohasset had a pretty uh, epic career here. Uh, those were tough shoes for him. Um, and then you got Darian Goats, another Hermantown kid. Um, all three of them are are moving on. And a lot of that had to do with the recruits that UMD has, has lined up and we're going to get into them. So um, would they have had more money when, when Ben Steve signed? Yeah, but uh, Scott seems committed at this point in his roster building to use that on, on recruits um, initially, you know, and this gets into another question here, Richard Carlson. Um, this is kind of relating to Blake Biondi going in the transfer portal. Did coach Sandlin advise his fifth year eligible players, if he wanted them to come back for a fifth year or not in his postseason meetings with them. Um, I actually want to go back to last year. I think if Jason Shagaby or Zam plant come in, Quinn Olson and Luke Lohite aren't, aren't back this year. If Adam Guyon decides to come in from uh, Chippewa Falls and not play this year with Green Bay, Matthew Teason isn't back. Um, Scott was bringing back fifth years, those first few years. A, there were guys that had two rings on their finger that had you know won back-to-back national championships. You want those guys around. Um, two, as Bruce mentioned, the pandemic set back a lot of players in their development. Um, some guys didn't play for an entire season in 2020, 2021. So, uh, they didn't get that off season and such. So at that time it was just better to bring back guys for fifth years, bring in older players from the transfer portal. Now we're at a point where at least how Scott Sandlin and his staff want to build the roster, they want to go back to bringing in recruits guys. W- what are your thoughts on, do you think I'm right on, on that? As I look at this roster building when it comes to fifth years versus transfers versus, you know, freshmen, Bruce, I'll let you start. I think there's room in, in what they're doing right now for transfers. And and there's some questions that have to be answered uh, regarding the roster for 2024, 25 here in the next couple of weeks, as we're recording this, the, the portal's not open yet for undergraduates. And I think that might answer some questions as to how they're going to build the roster for 2024 25 because the other thing that's been purposeful from this coaching staff is not just you know having guys like Zam Plant and Jason Shagaby and Adam Guyan play another year of juniors above and beyond maybe what was necessary but it's recruiting players that are okay with that you know Ashton Doms the kid that play, uh, played part of the season for the Minnesota Wilderness and put up just some ridiculous numbers in the North American league. He's doing well now in Des Moines in the USHL. He committed after he he had uh, gone back down to Des Moines and started playing in the USHL again. He's going to play another year in the USHL. That's that's the plan, and he's on board with that. And and these are important things in the recruiting process, I I, I think, is they're identifying players that can help them down the line, that can fill certain roles for them, but also players that are buying into the process. And – that's why I think that there is room in this group, depending on who else might leave, who might jump in the portal, there is room in this 2024-25 group for potentially a transfer because they're not, I don't think that they're inclined to bring guys in early unless it's absolutely necessary because that has come back to bite them a little bit here. I think it's hurt the development of some players coming into college a year earlier than expected. Zach, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the ultimate goal is to set not just the the team up for success, but also to set these individual players up, up for success. And and when you look at somebody like Blake, you know, and you ask the question, what, what would his career have looked like? Uh, what would his development be like if he had gone and played a year at juniors? 
I don't know. I can't remember the last player that we talked to that said he regretted going back to juniors or honestly, the guy, last guy we talked to who said he regretted coming back to college, you know, and that's not necessarily a shot at a guy like Ben Steves who goes to the pros after his sophomore season. Some of that is you got to go where the opportunity is. You don't know what's going to happen next year. Ben Steves comes back and scores seven, eight goals. Maybe he's not the offered the same kind of contract with the NHL uh, in this case, Florida that, that, that he was, but you know, the development of, of players, I feel like sometimes, especially these high names, and, and we're going to see it next year with Zam Plant, we're going to see it with Adam Guyan, you know, names that the the community and the fan base has been excited about since they committed. They come in here and they maybe are um, expected to to be light years ahead of of the other guys. And and it's not necessarily always the case. You know, some guys grow into it. And um, you know, I think that Scott over the years has done a really good job of of trying to do right by the players that he has. Um, and not that's not just the recruits, that's the players on the roster um that that he's committed himself to. And you know what? Uh when Blake signed on uh for this year um or for his career at UMD, Scott's committed to him for four years and, and he gave him four years. Right. And, and now it's time to, for both of them to see what, uh, what something else brings. And I think that's okay. Um, because now Scott is committed to this next group of incoming freshmen and, and they deserve the same kind of opportunity that Blake and, and the others got four years ago. Should be pointed out that when Ben Steves was deciding uh, whether or not to sign his contract with the Florida Panthers, whose top minor league affiliate is the Charlotte checkers in North Carolina, um, snowstorm and blizzard warnings were being descended upon the D Duluth area. So um, timing is everything, people. I mean, if you were facing a snowstorm coming your way and um, he's a poor college kid, probably doesn't have a snowblower at, at that house, uh, said peace out to his roommates and said, have fun shoveling that. I'm going to Florida and, and Charlotte. So um, I can't help but think maybe that influenced uh, Ben Steves in saying two years of of Duluth uh, was enough. Um, after Blake Biondi, the next player everyone is asking about is Cole Spicer. Uh, and as we talked about in, in part one, Cole, um, one of two centers along with Dominic James, who missed um, a large chunk of the season, Dom, basically the entire season. Uh, Cole was out for the second half because he was academically ineligible. Um, everyone wants to know, Sam Brady asks, will Cole Spicer be back next year? And the answer to that right now is we don't know. Uh, and we may not know until August. Uh, from, from what I understand, he's going to, you know, he's taking classes again um, this, this uh, fall winter, the winter spring semester, winter semester at UMD, whatever you want to call it. Um, long double winter semester. He's going to be taking summer courses. Um, they, they may not know until, um, till August. Guys, in, in, in the meantime, how do you think UMD should proceed? If they can get Cole Spicer eligible, I think, A, that'd be great for Cole Spicer. Everyone was curious why he didn't just run off to Major Junior or anything like that and or go to the USHL. And he goes to the USHL, he's still going to be ineligible for college. Uh, he goes to Major Junior. He still only gets a couple months, and, and he'd be forced to sign with Boston. Um, he definitely needs more development before going to the pro level. Um, guys, how do you think UMD should proceed for, for Cole Spicer going forward, not knowing? And and before everyone panics, like, oh, we may not know until August. I feel like the long the, the longer there's no news, the, the better. That means he's getting hopefully closer to being academically eligible again for the fall. Guys, how do you think they should uh, proceed? Zach? Well, option A is you want Cole Spicer on the team, I think, next year. Um, you know, he fills a need that they have. Um, I think he was, it was playing – better uh after dominic james's injury uh you know who knows how the season ends up if if cole spicer plays the second half of, of last season and stays healthy uh, i think he makes he makes umd better uh this season than they were um but you know that's option a and and i think it's obviously a good thing for cole too you know we don't know what happened it's you know quite frankly none of our business about you know why he's academically ineligible but the best thing for him to do is is to 
to recognize what happened, to put his uh, his head down and, and do the work this semester and, and through the summer and get eligible again and come back and prove it to his teammates that he wants to be here and he can be contributing. Um, you know, and, and if he does that, then great. And if not, they're going to need another centerman um, and they're going to be back, uh, you know, whether it's in the portal or whether it's one of these young guys that they got coming in, asking them to do something that maybe they haven't done a lot of. Um, or, you know, I mean, Scott Sandlin always says, you know, one when one guy goes down, goes away, graduates, whatever, it's an opportunity for the next guy. And so, um, you know, I I think that if, if Cole Swisher can be on the roster next year, you want him on the roster. And, and if not, then, you know, your guess is as good as mine is what they should do. Bruce, your thoughts on, on Cole, who 10 years ago would, wouldn't still be at UMD. Honestly, it's un, it's kind of unheard of that uh, a player gets academically ineligible and remains at school to take, to, to go to class instead of finding somewhere to just go play hockey. Yeah, I give him credit for for trying to commit to that, right? Like it, it couldn't have been easy to get that news. And and uh, again, you know, you're talking about a guy who came in at 18 years old, was you know youngest guy on the team at the start of the season, and you know obviously we hope it works out, and, and he's able to to find a way to get eligible. The reality is, the coaching staff is going to have an answer before we have an answer. They they're going to know before we know. And, and that's going to allow them to plan whatever the plan is. And I would rather have Cole Spicer on this team than anybody coming in that, that they could find right now. Uh, the other thing to think about, and, it, and maybe this goes toward the roster conversation as this continues, but if you map out the 24-25 team, as it stands right now, you've got seven players that have either that are there are centers most recently have been centers or are capable because they played the position before that's without Cole Spicer. So if the answer is Cole Spicer is not coming back, he can't get eligible. We're going to have to move on. Then they don't, they're not tied to having to bring a center in. It can be a forward of any description because you already have seven players that are capable of the middle and that that kind of depth, as we know, we saw this past season, that kind of depth is really important. Yeah, I, I would think what you're going to see from from UMD moving forward, honestly, is is they're going to probably plan as if maybe they won't have Cole Spicer in the fall. And that's probably a better plan than relying on him him being there. You know, again, let him focus on his academics. And if he's if he's here, he's he's here. But um, yeah, that's going to be interesting tightrope to walk. They got to do it as, as well with, with another player. And this another question from uh, Richard Carlson. Um, how is Will Francis coming along and will he get another year of eligibility? Um, the eligibility question by redshirting in the second half, um, I believe that does mean he's still eligible for next year. Uh, there were some questions. If he didn't redshirt, they'd have to apply for hardship waivers and all this stuff. Um, that hasn't been done yet. So Will didn't want to waste a, a, a semester. Um possibly not being back to, to full strength. We've seen Will in practice uh, here and there. Bruce, you and I have, have caught him. Um, he still stands out because he's that big guy. He's got that big frame. Um, he looks okay in practice, but but we don't see Will every every day. Um, I, think this is, I think this was a good move for him to take another semester off. I know there are two different types of battles with cancer between Zach Stasko, um, you know, testicular cancer, and, and he came back for another semester battling leukemia twice. I mean, man, I, I admire Will Francis for, for sticking with it. Guys, what do you think the team should expect from, from Will Francis next year? If, if he's good to go in, in the fall, Zach? Well, I mean, we are not privy necessarily to, to where he is in his treatment um, right now and where he is in, in the recovery and, you know, how quickly that's going. Uh, we'll know more obviously as we get into the fall and, and are able to talk to the coaching staff and, and to Will himself. But, you know, assuming that that's kind of on the track that they expect, I think it's okay right now for the, the staff and for the fan base to be cautiously optimistic about what kind of impact Will can make next year. You know, he's a big body. He's got a great shot. Um, he's, he's a, 
he's something that that defensive core lacked this year. And, and it was painfully evident, you know, the Bulldogs got bullied in, in most every series that they played, um, especially the series that they struggled in um, size and strength was a weakness of that uh, of that defensive core and of the forward group, to be quite honest. Um, and and Will brings that. I think uh, their their freshman uh, Kleber can bring that, but he's he's going to be a freshman. Um, and so I think that at this point, I'm cautiously optimistic that Will can return um, and and play a pretty big impactful role for UMD. But uh, you know, obviously that that's secondary at this point for those of us on the outside looking in. Bruce. I think you've talked about it in the last episode, what, what will Francis, you know, if he's healthy and, and ready to go in the fall could, could bring for the Bulldogs blue line. Oh, and fingers crossed that he's healthy. That's the first thing. Uh, and, and hopefully that's the case. If, it, if that's the case, I, I think he's a big factor. And I don't think it's an accident that if you lay out with this roster, a uh, barring some sort of unforeseen departure is going to look like next season probably not an accident that they're looking at having nine defensemen because that will give them a little bit more insurance that they didn't have this year on the off chance that, that something is amiss and Will's not able to go every single weekend. You know, I, they, it wasn't an option to have a ninth defenseman last year because they were counting on Will and, and the recurrence of cancer didn't come until August. So they, they kind of had to work on the fly with that. But if he's healthy and he's 100%. I'm excited to see what he can do in this lineup and potentially be a big time impact player. Eight defensemen and a utility player in, in Joey Pierce. That's back. a good point. Yeah. 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 Eight defensemen. We're, we're listing Joey Pierce, the Swiss Army knife. Go back to, to part one of the, the season finale to hear us gush about uh, Joey Pierce. Uh, these next two questions relate to each other. Um, Paul asks, um, Do you see anybody, any other Bulldogs entering the transfer portal this season? Um, again, uh, it opens for underclassmen on March 31st, Easter Sunday. Um, I'm hearing there might be two Bulldogs, uh, names, uh, from the men's team popping up in there. I think the women are, are done with players popping in the, the transfer portal, but, um, who knows, uh, we saw with the women and Taylor Stewart and Lizzie Norton the last two years, they graduate and then they end up in the portal. So, um, there are windows now, but graduate students, of course, can can go in it at any time. Um, but, you know, do you see any other Bulldogs entering the transfer portal? My sense is there might be a couple more. Um, Red asks, does Ben Steves count as an unplanned departure warranting another move, either in recruiting or the transfer portal? Uh, I think they were, and I don't want to call Ben Steves an unplanned move. I think the two moves that, you know, if you have one or two more players entering the portal, underclassmen, that'll be unplanned. And those players, UMD is going to have to probably address in the transfer portal. Um, but uh, Ben Steves, I think they were anticipating that that he might not be back. Guys, what, we kind of touched on it, I guess, a little bit already. What are your thoughts on on how maybe UMD needs to, to proceed moving forward if they, they lose any more players? Currently, they have eight signed to national letters of intent. Um, that would be, as I pull up my recruiting, they got uh, four forwards at the moment, two defensemen, two goaltenders. They're going to need more forwards. Bruce? Yeah, and I think that, you know, obviously Ben Steve's a big part of this group, and, and that's probably a significant amount of scholarship money that does allow them, you know, maybe if they wanted to dip into the portal and try to find a a scoring wing that can take that that spot for a year or two. Maybe that's an option for them, but that's all speculation, conjecture. Uh, there's no question they're going to have to find, I think, one or two players in the transfer portal, especially if they're going to lose a couple of more players. Uh, because, you again, going back to what I already said, it's been purposeful to not be bringing guys in early. I don't think you want to get back in the habit of, Okay, I've got this guy that I got recruited for 2025, 20, 26, but I need I need him right now. That's not a way to build a roster. I don't think in 2024 for this program, it's not. If it happens once or twice over the course of of a five year rolling five year period, okay, you can deal with that. But I think you're much better off if you can temporarily fill that hole for one or two years in the portal and give these coaches an opportunity to find the right player that can help them in, in, in that one or two year time frame. Zach, your thoughts on, on how UMD fills these holes going forward. Yeah, 
it'll be interesting to see, you know, how many players they need out of the portal, um, you know, what positions they need, what area of the depth chart they're trying to fill. You know, do you expect, uh, you know, as maybe some of us do, do you expect Zam Plant and Jason Shagabe, Max Plant to come in and, and fill top six roles all season, you know, be the the offensive stars that they have been at lower levels? Do you expect that right away? Or do maybe you need somebody who's going to come in and and try to, to contribute offensively? Are you okay adding like a fourth line center or a wing, just a guy who plays a hard honest, heavy game. Um, you know, one thing I think we've learned uh, with Derek Dashke and now Connor McMenamin is that it's really difficult for fifth year guys to come to Duluth and play a style that Scott Sandlin expects when they've been playing such a different style for four years. Both those guys played such a differing style than, than the one that Scott Sandlin has championed here in Duluth. And both of them struggled and so I think that now, as we're getting further into the portal conversations, finding the right type of guy, um, you know, may not be a superstar, but can come in and, and maybe is a bit younger, maybe has two or three years of eligibility left, kind of like a Luke Bast, um, you know, come in, somebody you can mold and shape. Um, that might be a better option than a fifth year guy, but it depends on who's out there. You know, maybe some guy jumps out and, and you know, calls Duluth and says, hey, I've always wanted to come here, um, you know, and, and now's my chance. You're going to take that guy if he's that good, but it's just no knowing until uh, the list comes out. So it should be noted this this is the last year of the fifth years. Um maybe next year um in 25 26 you might have the uh, I'll call it the Naomi Rogi out there who's around for 6 years cuz they redshirted or something like that. But this is the last of the fifth years. So going forward in the portal you're not going to have those, but I think Zach brought up the the, the key thing it's going to have to be the right player. The right player is when I think Scott, you know, dips into the portal and and brings that person in i don't think he's going to do like other programs and necessarily try and and build extensively through through the portal and i actually think a lot of college hockey programs moving forward at least the the higher end ones um maybe programs that are trying to rebuild are going to be rely a lot on the portal but i think your your top programs are not going to be and this is on the men's side are not going to rely on the portal um the women's side's a little, little, a little different. There's, um, that's a side where we've seen with the national champion Ohio State Buckeyes, where players are leaving programs and seeking out winners. Um, and granted, women's hockey, men's hockey, the it, it's a different dynamic. Men's hockey, the top players can go pro. Women's hockey, still your best experience is playing in the NCAA. Though, if the PWHL keeps growing that that could change things there as well um rolling on in questions let's get into them the recruits dan jacobson uh who is the most exciting incoming prospect on the men's team uh and i'm going to run through the prospects uh, we've mentioned a lot of the names already um umd has a uh, currently signed to nlis you got zam plant and max plant uh jason shagaby and uh callum arnott uh arnott's playing in the bchl you got uh, two defensemen, Ty Hansen from Hermantown. Um, I think a lot of people are excited to finally see him come in. He's really uh, grown in, in such a, at the junior level. Uh, Adam Kleber, uh, you're going to hear his name around draft time. That's another defenseman. Um, Adam Guyon, uh, world-class goaltender from Slovakia, probably could have been in college ar already, uh, but he wanted to go back and, and play for the, the Green Bay Gamblers and, and such. Um He's teammates with with uh, Shagabi. And then you got uh, Clayton Knapp, another goaltender uh, out of the North American League for the Bismarck uh, Bobcats. Those two are are signed. Um, I would bring up maybe a couple other guys as I find my recruiting list here somewhere. We'll get There's going to be some more recruits coming in, but that group signed to NLIs, guys. Um, who excites you the most right now? Zach, I'll let you start. Well, obviously, um, there's a couple of guys on this list. I, I talked about Adam Kleber earlier. I'm, I'm excited about his size that he offers to the defense core. Uh, Adam Guyan is going to be the de facto number one goalie when he steps on campus um, next year. And so that, that'll be an, an exciting, uh, although maybe a bit of, uh, um, it, you know, just maybe a 
something that it, you're going to need to give him time to grow, right? You know, when a freshman comes in and, and is going to play a heavy percentage of the games. But I mean, I think that just being around here, the most exciting guys on that list are Sam and Max Plant. I mean, they've been talked about for years. Uh, the kids of, of Derek Plant, of course, um, and they've both been playing really, really well. Uh, Zam in the USHL and then Max with the the USA uh, under 18 team. And so, um, you know, as far as excitement, guys that can come in and change a program can be the face of the program, if not immediately soon thereafter. Um, those are two guys that have kind of been, you know, a lot like Blake Biondi, you know, born and bred for this. And this was a lot of what we were talking about when Blake was coming in. Zam and Max have the added advantage. Zam has played in a true junior uh, uh, season, and then Max has been with the the uh, USA development team. And so a little bit different situation than Blake, but still a lot of the same adjectives that we were using when Blake came in four years ago. Yeah, those two other recruits that I just looked at my script here that I got lost on. Uh, Harper Benz, he's a teammate of Zam Plants on the Fargo Force right now. Um, I would think it, with the way things are going, um, I could see him coming coming in. Um, is it great to let him go? Both of these guys, they're players that'd be great if they could go back a year, but I, I think they're the way they're scoring and producing in juniors, they, they could be ready uh, to come in. And then uh, Blake Beckin, who's a teammate of uh, Shagabi and Guyan on the the Gamblers. Bruce, who's your most exciting guy? I'm gonna uh, I'm excited for for Guyan only because I want to hear the perspective of a Slovakian moving to Wisconsin and living in Chippewa Falls and Green Bay. Like that's his exposure to America right now. I can't think of two more Wisconsin cities than Chippewa Falls and and Green Bay. You guys should bond over Culver's when he gets here. I'm a storyteller and I love Culver's and Quick Trip and and I'm a Wisconsin guy. So we're going to, I'm sorry to everyone that's going to have to listen to that podcast. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should apologize to Adam for having to answer my stupid Wisconsin questions. Bruce, Um, you're a Wisconsinite. I am. I are certainly you? am. Yeah. I'm not quite as enthralled with all the things that you are, but um, I'm still, when that podcast happens, I will be the first one to do I can promise you that. Um, I, boy, the plant boys come to mind immediately. So much fun to watch at Hermantown and, and, and they both, you know, Max has grown in a lot of different ways, including physically in his time with the under 18 program. But the, the thing that from, from the conversations I've had is and knowing their parents, Derek and Christy, over the years, they are mindset changers. Like it's one thing to to be the kind of players that they are, but but I think these guys are they're going to lead a, a a transition, a growth period for this program that I'm really excited to see. Based on what you guys have seen, if any, this question's from uh, Nicholas Lentz. Uh, of Zam Plant and Juniors, how much of his success will translate at the college level with the Bulldogs? Does it look like he'll have an easier, difficult transition? I would say because they let Zam go back to juniors, I think his transition is going to be much easier than it would have been had he come in two years ago when he was drafted by the the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, you know, looking at Zam's numbers with the Fargo Force this year, um, he has 64 points through 51 games this year. 23 goals, 41 assists, um, compared to that to what Ben Steves did. Another guy that was allowed to, you know, cook in, in the junior level, um, his second year in the USHL before coming to UMD, 77 points in 70 games, 45 goals, 32 assists. Um, Zam more of a setup guy than, than maybe, uh, Steves was. Um, I think I, I know a lot of people have been waiting a long, a long time for Zam to get here. He had actually signed an NLI to come to the Bulldogs, um, in 23, 24, um, guys, you think the transition for that him, you think he can transition like Steve's did because he had that extra time, Zach. Yeah, he certainly can, you know, will he, I guess uh, I'm not ready to, to say that yet, but he's got pieces around him. Um, assuming that Dominic James is, is back healthy. His brother's going to be here. Shagabe, uh, proved what he's capable of both at the high school and the junior level. So, I mean, you know, and then if you get Cole Spicer back, you have Anthony Mangini, Matthew Perkins, you know, now you're starting to talk about UMD, uh, you know, young is that roster or those those guys may be that i just listed you're starting to talk to you about umd as more of uh you know 
offense by committee type of team than just an offense by Ben Steves type of team. And, and as good as Ben Steves was, he can't score all the goals. And so talking about Zam plan is more of a setup man. His brother Max is even more of a setup man than Zam is. That's okay. If this team can whip the puck, puck around, they got guys who can hit a half empty net. They got guys who can hit their spot, right? And, and it doesn't always need to be Ben Steves from the right wing circle. Uh, so I'm excited for that part of it. I think Sam, you know, it's not going to be easy by any means, but, you know, based on what I've seen of him, I haven't sat down and watched entire Fargo Forest games. I've seen mainly his highlights and I think it's easy to get excited about a guy when you watch just his highlights, but his highlights are pretty dang good. So I'm excited to uh, see some of them when he's wearing a UMD jersey. Yeah, we should have put that disclaimer when we were talking about Caitlin Kramer in, in episode one. <laughs> um, that's another player whose highlights are are, are pretty good, but um, we think she's going to live up to the highlights. Bruce, what do you what are your thoughts on on Zam coming in? Besides being really excited to yell Zam really loud on the radio when he scores, I'm looking forward to, to going back to the old days with the Andersons and, and Joey and Mikey and Matt and having to just call guys by their first names all the time, so you know who's who. That's going to be fun. Um, I've seen Zam plant play about as many games as Zach has in juniors. Uh, and I, it's the same thing. Like you see highlights and you get excited for highlights cause you're human and that's what happens and that's fine. But let, you know, I, I do think that he's going to have a, an easier transition because he played the extra year of juniors. And again, this is not an accident that you're seeing more of this because they, th these coaches know if, if you can stay down there and you can dominate the USHL, you're in a better position to come in here as a more confident player. A more confident player coming in is more likely to make an immediate impact. It worked really well for Ben Steves, and I think it's going to work well for Zan Plant. Maybe not to the 21-goal Ben that we saw from Ben Steves last year, but it's going to work well. All right, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more of your questions. You're listening to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essentia Health. Greetings from Northlandia, a place to bring your curiosity, because here you will find curiosities. Whether it's a look inside the Northern Rail Train Car Inn, or an introduction to Duluth's musical roboticist, Robot Rickshaw, we celebrate the region's distinctive people, places, and history. Each week, I'm joined by my fellow reporters who share the unique and fascinating stories that they discover while exploring the Northland. You can find new episodes of the Northlandia podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Join us along this journey and discover the extraordinary stories that you just might miss if you're not in the right place at the right time, ready to step off the beaten path with no rush to return, here in Northlandia. Hi, I'm Maria Lockwood, a reporter with the Superior Telegram. Explore Superior and Douglas County history with me on Archive Dive, a monthly podcast available at superiortelegram.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to the Bulldog Insider Podcast, brought to you by Essential Health Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. They're proud to be the team physicians for the UND Bulldogs and provide sports medicine care to more than 25,000 student athletes in the community to ensure they can compete at the highest level while protecting their long-term health and athletic futures. Thanks to Essentia Health for their support of the Bulldog Insider Podcast. I'm Matt Wellens, along with Zach Schneider and Bruce Siski. More of your questions. Uh, Troy Rain, who will the captains be next year? Let's start with the women. Uh, Zach already had a prediction for them. Zach, Who's wearing the C for the women next year? I don't think it's e easy either uh, because it's it's one of two players, and maybe they're both going to wear a C, but I I gave it to Clara Van Weeren uh, in, in part one of this season finale. I'll stick by that and say that Nina Job smith wears the A again, um, along with maybe Hannah Baskin. Um, those are my three in the, the captaincy group uh, for UMD next year. Yeah, I find that group tough to argue. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Nina and Clara sharing sharing the C and then uh, Baskin back there. Uh, Coach Hannah Baskin, as, as we called her on the podcast earlier uh, this year, also wearing a a letter. Uh, Bruce, anyone to add to that leadership group for the women, you think? Maybe a Mary-Kate O'Brien. Um, that would be the other name that I thought of. And and maybe you have you know two Cs and two As. I don't know how they're going to construct it. If it's just three players, how are you going to make that decision? That's not an easy one. But I do tend to think that co-captains is a, 
a pretty good bet for the women next year with Claire and Nina. I think that that one, that's a pretty solid one. Yeah. And I think it, it, you give MK that letter next year that sets her up for being a, a, a cat. I think everyone agrees. She's, she's a future captain uh, of the Bulldogs yeah. as yeah. well. Uh, the men, is it Dom James? I, everyone I think forgets Dominic James started the year as an assistant captain uh, and got injured. What was it, Bruce? Five periods into the season? Five periods into the season. I think yeah, he had but, taken 21 faceoffs. Yeah. So Dom James gets a redo on, on cap. You know, they end up Connor McMenamin gets promoted. Um, uh, Dom James probably wearing the, the C, uh, but, but who else do we see in that, that leadership group? Uh, it's going to be a really young team next year. It is. And I think Dom is uh, pretty much a shoe in for the C. Um, as far as the A's, I would throw in guys like Aaron Pionk or Anthony Mangini as, you know, it, Guys that I think, uh, if they're not wearing A's in 2024-25, it's not happening very far down the road. But I, uh, I'm i relatively convinced that Aaron Pionk will be wearing a letter next season for UMD. That's how highly the, the coaches and his teammates seem to think of him. Zach, anyone else you'd toss in there? I tossed in Carter Loney maybe for an A. Um, kind of depends on you know his offseason probably in, in, because he's not going to be necessarily a, a – you know, always in the top six, depending on how some of these freshmen, he might be in a third line role, but it doesn't mean he can't be a leader. Right. And it doesn't mean he can't, you know, be a, a strong voice for these young guys. I, I've liked Carter's game when he's consistent, he's on, I think Aaron um, is a good pick for the other one. And the thing I like about Aaron, and then when you threw Mary Kate in uh, Mary Kate O'Brien and on the women's side about having somebody who's younger in that role, Right. Not only does it give just extra credence for some of these younger players like Caitlin Kramer, like the Plant Brothers, like Ty Hansen to go to, um, but it also just sets you up for for such a culture building two or three years. And I think that's probably where both the men and the women are at, where their culture at the foundation is, is really good, but it's time to start getting closer to the top of that foundation again for both these programs. And by doing that, I think that you start that process uh, back where, where you should. Yeah. You know, kind of recapping here, Dominic James, I think we're thinking he'll have the C maybe Aaron P on Carter Loney with the A's. I'm going to throw one more wild card, Joey Pierce, baby. If you're looking for, is Joey Pierce going to give a riveting speech in the locker room? Maybe, I don't know. He doesn't talk that extensively to, to, to us. Maybe he's a huge talker behind the scenes and, and we don't know. Um, maybe hockey land cut out hours and hours of Joey Pierce lines um, from, from that documentary. But if you're looking for a guy that leads by example, does his job, give Joey Pierce a letter. I think he's a great example for, for guys moving forward. This one's for Jeremy Stahl. Question about the women's team. Why does Maura Kroll always seem to have a shorter roster? With the transfer portal, wouldn't it make sense to at least find enough players with a year of eligibility to round out the roster? I think you see it more in women's hockey where you see the Gophers have done it, the Badgers have done it, um, Ohio State not as much. Um, you see teams maybe not always roll four lines. They may only roll three lines. I think a lot of these teams would rather just have a roster of players they're actually going to play than just fill up roster spots for the sake of filling up roster spots. You know, I, I think going into the year, Maura Kroll was looking to maybe add another player in the portal, but she didn't find the right player. So instead of just grabbing someone who's going to be there for a year um, and not playing them, she, she just didn't sign anyone. And I'm curious if Scott maybe does that at all. We've seen Scott carry shorter rosters as, as well i'm curious if maybe that's an option for the men what are what are your guys thoughts on on you know filling out the roster you know with the right people versus you know fill just filling out the roster what are your thoughts zach well more so in the women's game than the men's game i think the the top end talent is further away than the bottom end talent um, or some of the younger talent that just needs time to kind of mature and, and get better and so if you just bring in let's say it's a younger player you know to to be in and out on your fourth line that player isn't contributing a lot not only in games but maybe even in practices and, and for teams that that relish so much the competition that they create throughout the week in practice. I think that's doing a disservice, uh, perhaps not just to that player, but also the team as a whole. 
when this question popped up, I went and looked just at this year's roster. UMD carried 22 players, Ohio State 23, Wisconsin 23, Minnesota had 26, but two of them played just one game and one of them played just three games. And so what Maura Kroll and others are doing is saying, listen, we want the best players on our team, the right players on our team. We're not just going to take you and stick you on the shelf. Um, I don't think it's fair to the team. I don't think it's fair to the players. And I, quite honestly, I, I don't foresee it changing. Bruce, your thoughts? We, we've heard Scott Sandlin on the med side. Uh, he's not always a huge, he was not, uh, we should ask him now a couple of years into this, but he wasn't exactly a fan of you know, adding that 19 skater because he didn't like a guy that was possibly just sitting on the bench dressed, not playing. And I think that kind of dovetails into the, the roster as well. You don't want to just bring on a guy or, or you don't want to bring on a player just for the sake of bringing on, on a on a player. It's the line from Miracle, right? I'm not looking for the best players. I'm looking for the right ones. And I, I, I do think that there's something to be said for that. I, I think on the women's side, yeah, I, you just don't see a lot of teams rolling four lines. When Wisconsin came in here in January, and that was a doubleheader weekend with Miami playing the the, the men, there, Miami was the only team that had 19 skaters in, in both games. Wisconsin had 17 skaters on Friday and 16 on Saturday, won both games. It didn't affect them because their high end was so good and could play so much. And that's you see a lot of that in the women's game now. I, I don't think that's going to necessarily change. And you, know, you don't want to fill a roster just for the sake of filling it. That said, I think Scott Sandlin, after the year he just had with the injuries he suffered through with this team, I think he's going to do what he can to fill this roster as best he can because he doesn't want to go through that again. Uh, this one from uh, where are we going? Um, oh, another one from Jeremy on, on roster building, this time uh, more focused on the men. I've noticed that whenever USCHO or College Hockey News ranks the incoming recruiting classes, the Bulldogs are seldom listed in the top 10. Are Sandlin's recruits more under the radar? Is that what he prefers, finding the diamonds in the rough as opposed to filling up the well-known names? Um, I have a lot of respect for my colleagues at College Hockey News and USCHO, but the College Hockey recruit anywhere, ESPN, college basketball, college football, no one knows what the heck they're talking about with recruiting classes. Same thing with professional draft classes. No one knows what they're talking about. Um, these recruiting classes are being judged based on reputation. Some schools, they just automatically throw in the top 10, no matter what. Um, it's being judged on, have I heard that name? It depend where someone comes from too. Like someone from the Midwest is going to think differently of a recruiting class than someone from out East. Some people value only NHL prospects. That's all I got for that one. Uh, does Sandlin prefer kind of those diamonds in the rough? Maybe a little bit. I think Scott likes, you know, his favorite players are, are a Carson Kuhlman, a Parker Mackay. They may not be the best pro prospect. They're the best college player. Um, I think there's a number of teams in the NCAA that recruit that way. Uh, Rand Pecknold at, at Quinnipiac. He wants the best college players, not necessarily the best pro prospects. When I look at, you know, Boston College and Boston University, um, they're looking for draft that, you know, Michigan, a little bit Michigan state. Now they're looking for, you know, how many draft picks they can boast about, but where are your national titles? I guess is what I'll, 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 I'll ask. We've seen some really good pro prospect teams over the years, take on UMD and, and, and falter. So that that's my thought on, on the recruiting rankings guys, your thoughts uh, and on what Scott is looking for as he builds rosters. I mean, I honestly, I can't add a whole lot to that. You, you're, it, it's just a difference in philosophy, and and winning has it's permitted UMD to access maybe some different types of players than the ones that they were getting before. The the, the Parker McKay's and Carson Coolmans, you know, they they get an Isaac Howard that commits when he's young and comes in here, and it doesn't necessarily work out, but. But winning is what allowed them to access Isaac Howard and have a chance to bring a guy like that in. And that's okay to have those players. And it's not always going to work out. Sometimes it does. But at the end of it, the core of what this program is going to recruit are four-year guys that can develop. And we've seen that over the years. It has worked over the years. I don't see any reason to do it differently, especially now. With, with, you know, the high-end guys are going to go to a handful of different places. The, the, the high-end draft picks, the top guys, 
They're going to go to a handful of different colleges for a number of different reasons. They're going to play there one or two years and move on. You can still win recruiting the way UMB recruits. Anything to add Add there, Zach? Not much. Uh, you know, you look at some of the, the more highly prized draft picks that have come into UMD over the past 15 years. Isaac Howard is one. He decided that he would be better served playing somewhere else. Riley Tufty, another, um, who went through some struggles, but ended up, you know, finishing his career on a on a pretty high note. Uh, and then Justin Falk, you know, another one who was here for one year. So some of them work out, some of them don't in in a college game. Um, but UMD hasn't had a lot of like the the super blue chip type of recruits. I think that the the best players at UMD that that when we cycle through and we do like Matt's exercise of like all decade teams or like best Bulldogs to ever put on the jersey, you know, and you're talking maybe in, in the Scott Sadlin era because that's who we're talking about. You know, some of those those top end guys aren't on those lists because they're either here for one or two years and and maybe that you know, impacts the the legacy that they leave. But, you know, some of those top end guys, I think that the natural thing is that they think or they're being told by other people that their game got them to this point. It got you drafted in the first round. And you shouldn't change that because when you get to the NHL, that's the game they want you to play. Scott Salen thrives with players who are talented and willing to work hard and willing to listen to what he wants them to do. Those are the players that when we go back and we do all decade teams or best Bulldogs, they're at the top of the list because they stayed here. They, they, they grew through his coaching. They grew, grew through their own development. And a lot of them uh, in the last 15 years have either won titles or been close to winning titles. And so that's, it just depends on the type of player that you want. And, but no, as long as he's here, that's not going to change. You know, as I was writing about Ben Steves, uh, moving on to the, the Panthers, I thought it was interesting. The last four guys who would hit that 20 goal mark, Ben Steves, Alex Iafalo, JT Brown, uh, Justin Fontaine, all undrafted free agents who were able to develop um, some of them in only a couple of years at, at UMD and they had big years and then they went and, and signed pro contracts. So, uh, you know, I think that's, that's the bread and butter of, of, of UMD. You know, it didn't work out with Isaac Howard and I, you know, I'm glad UMD took a shot at him. He's a guy from this area, but um, you know, sometimes those players are, are, are better off going, um, to the Michigan States, the the Michigans, the the BCs and, and BUs. Question from Biddy here. How would you grade Scott Sandlin's performance as it relates to the changing college sports landscape with NIL, Transfer Portal, and the COVID year? And this could be like a two-hour long question getting into all of this. Guys, oh, what are your thoughts? I, I think, I don't think when it comes to NIL, men's college hockey has been impacted a ton yet. You know, we've heard Minnesota guys getting like a deal with, with he'd seen a few college guys get deals with like Chipotle where they get free burritos or something like that, but um, not huge money flowing in to the, the men's college hockey side at this point. So I don't think that's something Scott has had to uh, deal with, but I, it's been, it, we talked about it already a little bit, but it's interesting to see how Scott's philosophy has adapted through um, the transfer portal and, and COVID. Zach, you want to start on this one? Uh, sure. You know, the, the idea that Scott Sandlin's seat is, is relatively hot is frankly pretty ridiculous. I think uh, given the success that he's had with this program uh, you know, every time I just kind of roll my eyes um, you know, it's good that the program and the fan base have these kinds of expectations on the staff and, and on the players. That's a good thing. It comes, it's the price of success, right? It comes with winning championships. People want another championship and, and they should, but it took 60 some odd years for UMD to get their first championship. And now UMD hasn't won a title in the last five and people want things to change. You know, it, I think you know, if we're going to talk about this year's team and, and not to make excuses, but to make explanations about oh, injuries, illnesses, ineligibilities, look at what Scott Sandlin's had to do, not just with the roster makeup, people leaving early, uh, the COVID year. Look at what he's had to do with his assistant coaches. Brett Larson left in 2018. He was replaced by Adam Krause, who's still here. Jason Herder left in 2020. He was replaced by Derek Plant. Derek Plant 
left for the NHL. He was replaced by Cody Chupp. So, you know, Derek Plant, Brett Larson, and Jason Herter have five decades combined or more of coaching experience. And right now, there are two assistant coaches that have both been in the game since the 2017-2018 realm. You know, and that, again, you know, that's Scott Sandlin's job is to develop not just players, but but coaches. And he's done a great job of that. But I just, you know, I, I if I had to give him a grade, you know, over his tenure from 2000 to now, it's an A+. Plus. If I had to give him a grade from this year, B, I mean, it's not bad, um, you know, but you know, it's, it's certainly not up to the expectations that he and the program have set for themselves uh, with the success they've had over his, uh, his entire body of work. Yeah. And I don't, I, I don't think Biddy's among those calling for, for Scott's head, but we have seen others ask this question. I do wonder how many Bulldog fans hopped on the bandwagon in, in 27, in 20, probably not in 2017, but in 2018. Um, and, and we're expecting, you know, frozen fours and national championships every year. Uh, again, like I said, I don't th think from what I can tell, and it's probably something I need to start talking to more people about, at least on the men's side, I don't think NIL is impacting uh, a ton. And we're going to get into another question about NIL here, here next. The transfer portal is still like we're in this COVID window. I think Scott handled the COVID perfectly, like in terms of using the portal to supplement sports spots on his roster while other kids stayed in juniors longer to catch up because a lot of prospects um, got behind um, their, in their development because of COVID, whether they were playing at the youth level or the junior level, you know, there was basically no junior hockey in Canada for a year. So I think he's navigated that very well. I think this fifth year portion of the transfer portal, I think Scott's navigated it very, very well. Um, it'll be interesting to see what, how big of a deal the portal is moving forward after we get through the fifth years um, to see what, what that does to, to the sport, to see if college hockey goes the same way as, as basketball or football, where just everyone's hopping in year. Now the women's game, that that's a little different. Um, Ohio state is, is, their student athletes are, are getting NIL opportunities there. Um, the Buckeyes use the transfer portal extensively uh, to pluck top players from, from some Eastern schools, from Hockey East, to build their roster this year and win a national championship. Um, and, and I'll throw out the next question from, from, from Rolf here. How can schools like UMD compete in the new NIL NCAA? Got any ideas, guys? Uh, we've seen a few schools... North Dakota's announcing a collective. I'll be honest, that doesn't really scare me. I feel like that's just something they can advertise to say, look, we have a collective like everyone else. But a North Dakota collective is not the same as an Ohio State collective. Um, heck, a Minnesota collective is not the same as an Ohio State collective. Ohio State's an entirely different animal. Those are schools that worry me a little bit. Guys, uh, how do you think UMD can compete in uh, the NCAA with with NIL, which again is something I think that's still going to continue to to change and evolve because it's the wild, wild west, and eventually there's going to be some rules in place. Bruce, first off, let's be afraid of North Dakota's collective because that red pepper money is going to start flowing in, and uh, you just never know what's going to happen after that. In all seriousness, it's I think it's the way that that you've built these championship teams, and that is through recruiting and developing and. Your the difference is that with the portal now a thing, you are pretty much always recruiting your players. You're you're trying to make them understand, and I think Scott's talked about this. Every player on a roster has a value. It doesn't matter what your job is. If you're a middle six forward, if you're a bottom pair defenseman, if you're the seventh defenseman, the thirteenth forward, if you're a fifth line guy, a third goalie everybody has a value and as long as you can you have players that understand that value and they're able to embrace their role and their value on the team you're going to be okay 
and yeah, you'll have once in a while that 13th forward might say, you know what, it's been three years of this. I'm going to go somewhere I can play a little more. And that's okay. As long as you have a strong foundation, you're okay. I, I think the difference right now is there's some question marks elsewhere on the roster and some holes that have to be filled. And, and that leads to what we see next year, which is going to be a very big class of guys coming in. But hey, more often than not, you're what they're doing is going to work. It's sustainable long-term. I don't think the transfer portal in this sport is sustainable long-term. I think recruiting the way UMD recruits is. So I like their chances. Zach, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, going back a couple of questions ago about the, the blue chip type of recruits versus the, you know, more of the guys that UMD has chosen to focus on. It's the blue chippers that are going to get a lot of this NIL money, you know, if they go to a program that has a collective like in Ohio State or even in North Dakota, you know, I mean, just looking up and down the roster, and this isn't to say anything bad because I'm excited about this year's freshmen, who among them, you know, would be flipped by NIL money. You know, you could make the argument that maybe Zam Plant would get some NIL money if he went somewhere else, but that guy was always going to be a bulldog. And I don't think, you know, some NIL money is going to change his opinion. Um, if the money is that important to you, I think Scott Sandlin's been around the game long enough that he's going to say, good, I hope, I hope you get it. I hope you have success where you're going, but you're not coming here. Um, that's not uh, what we're, what we've been about. And it's not what we're going to be about. Maybe that changes once Sandlin's tenure is done, whenever that is. But uh, I mean, again, it's one of those things I think as long as he's in charge, uh, I don't anticipate, uh, it playing a big factor in UMD's plans. I think you look at the rest of the NCHC is St. Cloud going to be offering up, you know, NIL opportunities for everyone. Yes. Denver is in a big city, but it is so far down the pecking order of sports in that city. They're not even the big college Colorado and Colorado state get more attention. North Dakota is big in, in, in grand forks and, and maybe some of their players will get some opportunities, but you know, I, I think in the Big Ten, it's probably more of a concern. And and again, those blue chippers are the ones that are probably the ones asking, well, how much money am I going to get if in NIL if I come to your school? And those aren't the players UMD's uh, looking after. All right, guys, uh, we saved the uh, ever popular question for last. The one all of you, some of you probably just tuned into this podcast for, and I made you wait until the very end from Mr. Daniel Jacobson. Any word on the schedule? Bruce, you're you're kind of the mast. I think both of you and, and I have some some insight. What what can we disclose and what can we not? Uh, what what I can disclose and what I cannot. That's a great question. I don't know what the answer to that is. So guess what? I'm going to tell you what I know. Uh, I don't know dates. Um, they are hosting Minnesota for two games next season. I believe they are hosting Stonehill for a two game series next season. They are at Lowell for uh, the 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 return trip from that series that happened like in 1994 or something like that, or at least it feels like it's been that long. The trip uh, Bruce a... and I hoped that Scott Sandlin and uh, we'll just, just, forget forgot, just forgot about, we were hoping they'd forget <laughs> yep. about it, but finally going back to Lowell. And if, if anything, maybe Normie Bay's and out in, in Lowell reminded them a couple of times, but they're making the good on that one here this coming season. Uh, rest of the non-conference, I think is still up in the air. I think they're home and home with Bemidji at some point, but I think that got shifted around. Uh, so the dates might be different than what they were initially planning because of Arizona State's insertion into the NCHC. They redid the conference schedule. So we don't have all the details yet. I have been told by a reliable source that we do have Arizona State and Colorado College trips next season. We don't go to Denver. That's what I've been told. I don't know about the other side or the other, other three-team pod of Miami and Western and Omaha. But I've been told we do have Arizona State on the docket in Tempe next season, Matt. So at least we got that going for us. Hopefully it's in like December or something. Uh, yeah, I believe I was told the Arizona State trip is uh, in the winter during a okay. winter month. Um, All right. So that's, you know, I'm hoping February. That's usually when I like it. But uh, no, I, I think there's some ever changing uh, scheduling going on here. I'm um, trying to run Bruce said, you know, Bemidji state pretty sure is on there for, for a home and home, but those yes. dates, those dates are Scott and, and, and uh, Tom Saratori. They kind of, you know, work around each other to see when, when those work uh, got to go back to us. Yeah. This has happened before. US this happened Lowell. before with, with yeah. the WCHA when they changed their scheduling and, and they had to reconfigure some things yeah. with them and Mankato both. So 
they'll work together. They'll figure it out. It might be different weeks that they play, you know, they're, they're instead of being a Friday in one place and a Saturday in the other, but they'll get them in. Yeah. I believe Alaska Fairbanks is, is coming back. Yep. Uh, I think that's to, what I heard too. Yeah. To Duluth as, as well. Um, that's one of those where Scott's always nice enough to kind of help them out with their scheduling. They try and make multiple play multiple teams on, on a trip when they come down to the, the lower 48, you mentioned Stonehill, uh, uh, the Gophers, a lot of home games, a lot of home games on, on next year's schedule, uh, at Amsoil arena. I know Zach, you're going to be excited, uh, uh, about that. Not as many weekends off, uh, for you. I haven't seen the women's schedule yet. Uh, I haven't heard too much a, a, about that one. So, um, we'll see what the, the count is of, of dreaded double headers, uh, next year. I've heard it's high. That's all I know. All right. Final thoughts uh, from everyone as, as we close out season six here. Bruce, we'll let you go first. Kind enough well, to let you on this podcast occasionally. I appreciate that. It's very nice of you guys. And it, thank all the fans just sticking with us this year. This was not the year any of us wanted to see on the men's side. It was like, I, I can only speak for myself and, and watching you know what the coaches and players went through. It was difficult and there were a lot of things that happened along the way, and, and a lot of them weren't good, but uh, I can tell you this, they, those guys never quit. We saw that in that Denver, that, that last game against Denver, they were they were in that thing till the very end, and, and they they pushed as hard as they could push, and they just could not find enough goals to, to extend that game and extend their season, but you know, the, the people that stick with this program, you know, week in, week out, out that are loyal, we always appreciate you, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing what this looks like in 2024, 25 for both the men and the women. I think they're going to be vastly different teams on the ice. And I, I, to be honest, it's, you know, March, whatever right now, I'm already excited for it. Zach, your final thoughts on season six of Bulldog Insider Podcast. Crazy. We've been doing this this long. Yeah, it is a little bit uh, crazy. Um, my thought uh, as the season came to an end was, was this too shall pass. Um, you know, this was, uh, a, a season with, you know, quite honestly, a lot of black clouds over UMD hockey. Um, I, the women had their fair share of success, but, you know, I don't think ever got to the level that, uh, that they wanted to get to. And the men obviously struggled, uh, basically from the word go, um, you know, with, uh, a lot of different challenges and, and just weren't very good down the stretch, but, um, you know, that doesn't change uh, my appreciation for getting the chance to do this. Um, I hope it doesn't change the fans appreciation for the effort that's put in, uh, you know, by the players and, and the coaches and the staff. Um, the three of us are, again, in a unique position because we get a chance to know these people uh, away from hockey. Uh, we get a chance to tell their stories, uh, you know, win, lose or draw. And, um, you know, I, I hope that people view it in that light, you know, all, everybody involved, even people that we've talked about throughout the year and, and in this year end recap that we've said has, has struggled, um, you know, they were trying to win hockey games. And I think that's important to, to remember, um, you know, they're trying and it's a hockey game um, and, and they'll try to win more next year. I'm excited for it. I hope that they do. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but I think as we go into the, the long off season, um, you know, just uh, try to remember that this too shall pass. My thanks to all of you for listening uh, to the podcast, supporting uh, our coverage at the Duluth News Tribune of, of Bulldog Hockey, whether you're an advertiser, whether you are a subscriber, uh, a listener to this podcast, someone that subscribes to our newsletter, everything. Uh, thank you so much, because without you, I would have to, to get a, a real job um, and maybe have knowledge other than power plays and penalty kills and, 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 and all of that. Um, you, the listeners and, and readers and, and everyone, um, we all appreciate you so much. Um, that's all for season six of the Bulldog Insider podcast. Go back and catch up on all the episodes. Um, if you missed any of this, this season or from previous seasons, um, you could find Bulldog Insider podcast on Apple podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, we are on YouTube as well. Go check us out there. Subscribe and rate us. For more Bulldog hockey coverage, visit DuluthNewsTribune.com. Huge thanks to our sponsor, Essentia Health. They sponsor this podcast. They sponsor our newsletter. They sponsor the Bulldog Insider page at DuluthNewsTribune.com slash Bulldog Insider. They've been with us since season one of this podcast and even before that with the newsletter. 
Um, again, thanks to all of you who listen each week to this podcast. Assuming none of us signs a pro deal or enters the transfer portal, we'll catch you all next season. Thanks for listening.